This is the uh, MIT's 150th anniversary celebration interview with Dr. Martha Gray. Um, and if I can begin with the early years, um, where did you, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I grew up in and was born in uh, the Boston Boston area. I have to start over. Okay, I've been here ahead. too long. <laughs> <laughs> So I was born and grew up in the Detroit area, and I was there actually until I went to college. Um, so I grew up with uh, three sisters and a brother, and um, a father who was an engineer, and, and mom who was a nurse, uh, um, and had a, in some ways, unremarkable but wonderful, uh, wonderful upbringing. And family still live in the same town. But. Do you remember, was, it, was there any moment in your childhood where you just knew you were going to be involved in the sciences? Oh, when I was growing up, um, my whole th uh, view of what I thought my future would be were have to, th they're very typical, I think, of a girl of that era. Um, I used to teach nursery school in high school, so I thought that I'd spend my career teaching nursery school or maybe elementary school. I was good at math, so I said maybe you should be a math teacher. And um, I knew for, I don't know how I knew I was going to college, maybe because both my parents were college educated. They didn't come up for discussion. I knew I'd go to college, but I went to college thinking that I would be in Detroit for, or in Michigan at least, for my life, and, and that's what I would do. Um, and, and I'd be a teacher and do the regular things. I hadn't seriously considered science or engineering, uh, any of that, um, prior to going to college. Uh, college was really the place that my worldview expanded remarkably um, that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and, and how you wound up at Michigan State? Um, it, thinking about how I went to college is, you know, I thought about it a lot recently because my eldest has just uh, left for college uh, a few days ago, and that whole process was very, very different uh, for him than it was for me. I applied to two schools, Cornell and Michigan State. Um, it's perhaps embarrassing to say that I chose those two because I had family in both those places, and they seemed like perfectly wonderful schools. Um, Cornell cost, uh, you know, ten even <laughs> probably still now ten times what Michigan State cost, and so I went to Michigan State, and um, which was a wonderful choice, but not in any. Uh, I I wish I could tell you that I had thought about college in some strategic way. Uh, I'm not sure most people do, <laughs> um, but but that's how I came to be going to Michigan State. So how did your world view expand there? Well, one of the lucky things that happened in, at Michigan State um, for me was, number one, I was part of a residential college, and so that meant that though there were some 40,000 students at Michigan State at the time, you were in a much smaller cohort where you got to know both other students and faculty. And the, the college had a science, math, engineering type bent. They didn't call it that, but it, it tended to emphasize that. And uh, my worldview opened uh, for uh, uh, perhaps obvious reasons. One is that you meet people from all over the world, and their whole view of life is different than the one place I had grown up. And secondly, I had faculty who really reached out to me and perhaps others. And, um, and because of that, I wound up in computer science, actually. Someone said, you know, you're really good at this. You should consider it. And um, at that point, I had taken some math education classes, thinking that that's what I was going to go do. And, and I knew I was capable of more than that. And computer science was a lot of fun. And then that's what I did. Um, but, but I think I was, I was fortunate in just meeting the right people. Um, I'd say that's been true throughout my career. You meet people, they make you think about the world differently, and um, you do things you never anticipated beforehand, and that was true of my college experience. So when you, when you graduated from Michigan State, how did, you, how did the decision to come to MIT come about? Um, I decided to come to MIT, uh, uh, the, the backing up. Um, 
the sequence of events that led me to come to MIT were completely random chance, serendipitous. And, and a month before I said I was coming to MIT, I never would have known it. So to back up and explain that a, l a little bit further, um, uh, I actually applied to MIT and to other graduate schools uh, because I had a faculty mentor at Michigan State who said, you really should go to graduate school. I wasn't seriously considering it, but if I have a faculty mentor telling me you ought to at least apply, the worst that can happen is I turn people down. So I applied to MIT um, uh, and, and other schools uh, thinking I would for computer science graduate school. And I also applied to um, uh, industry. Completely coincidentally, uh, somebody from MIT, Roger Mark, uh, came to Michigan State. He came because he's the brother, uh, his brother-in-law's best friend, <laughs> happened to be my professor. So we were introduced. And Roger Mark came to MIT or came to Michigan State because, to talk about uh, the newly formed PhD program in HST in Health Sciences and Technology. And so he talked to me, and then he gave me a call about a month later and said, "You know, you've been admitted to MIT, but I think what you say you want to do this would be perfect for you." And uh, I can say more about what made it perfect, but that is the reason. I came to MIT is that he happened to go to Michigan State, that he met me, and that he called me after. And it was a perfect match for what I thought would be cool. And why was it a perfect match? Well, so uh, at this point, I had, I wasn't sure that I wanted to, so backing up since I didn't incorporate your question. Um, I knew it was a perfect match, uh, the, the suggestion that I join HS, the HST PhD program. Um, because at this point I was uncertain about a career as a pure computer scientist. Um, that I wasn't sure that was a fit for me in the long haul, even though I could do it. Um, I had developed some interest in medical applications, uh, both through research at Michigan State and elsewhere. And what really captured my imagination about HST was the idea you could do engineering or computer science in the context of medicine with applications to medicine. And you did it by working shoulder to shoulder, being in the same classroom with MD students, being taught by engineers, being taught by physicians. And to me, as a absolutely gut reaction, I thought, this is the way to do it. And I thought that was just the coolest academic idea I'd ever imagined. It was so different from from anything I had ever seen, and it just felt right. I was nervous that I could survive MIT, but I thought this, this was actually, uh, actually something I had to give it a shot. So is that the origins of your interest in sort of um, the propagating collaboration as a yeah, so, so um, the excitement that I had when I, f when I first made the decision to come to HST has actually only grown. And uh, I, I will tell you today that uh, it is absolutely the best professional decision I've ever made in my life to come to HST. And for the same reasons it was exciting to me then, it's what I continue to spend a lot of my time doing, helping other institutions, uh, governments uh, do the same kind of thing, because it remains a very unusual kind of experience. Um, uh, so uh, it, in fact, in my old age, we're talking about the early years now, but in my old age, <laughs> I now think one of the most important things I can do is, is help provide those kinds of opportunities for many, many more people than can get them now. Uh, is it is it the nature of collaboration itself, or is there something about HST that that is unique in your thinking? Yeah. So um, I've thought a lot about what makes HST tick. You know, is it is it my uh, is it my interpretation of the opportunity, and is that just a, a quirkiness that I have, or is there something fundamental about the way it is structured, and and you know, after nearly 30 years of participating on it, I actually think there is something quite fundamental about 
um, about how HST is structured and 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 implemented, um, and uh, the. Uh, the thing to compare it to is most of academics, virtually all of academics from a, uh, from an educational point of view, is disciplinary focused. The job of departments and department heads are to steward the discipline. And over 400 years, these disciplines have become narrower and narrower and narrower as the knowledge base has expanded extraordinarily. And that's a very, very powerful paradigm that has led to a huge number of advancements. Um, but it's a very different paradigm uh, when you think about where do you go with what you know and how do you do the next step than saying we're going to think about major problems, none of which are solved by single disciplines or professions or institutions or individuals for that matter. And it doesn't happen by accident when people are able to connect with other disciplines and professions and people. It's partly a phenotype, it's partly how people tick, but, but it also I think just as you can educate people in a disciplinary way of thinking, you can educate people to operate in a multidisciplinary world. So the magic of HST fundamentally is that y you can, you have to, become comfortable with multiple disciplines and professions. Um, the people that are attracted to it, like me, I think are instinctively drawn to those kinds of opportunities and less drawn to disciplinary opportunities. Um, but, but I think the experience of having to work side by side, teach classes with a range of disciplines uh, has, you know, helps you build the experience base that enables you to trust and value uh, other disciplines to to have an expertise yourself but understand how to reach out it does it, it becomes hard to articulate uh, in any sensible detail in general terms what happens um, but but there is a, a certain certain magic that is not replaced by content in a classroom or by a single professor. It's it's a community thing. It's a it's a value system thing. Do you think that is it the nature of the problems that you're working on that requires more I interdisciplinary? background? You know, I, I don't think it's that. I think there are huge problems. I, so I've focused, you know, most of my career, all of my career on, on medically related problems. But I think when you think about the environment and energy and uh, you know, economies, probably, there, there, there are many, many really important problems that are, that, that are not purely disciplinary. And you know, I should hasten. It's it's easy to interpret some of what I'm saying uh, uh, in in a way I don't intend. So I'm not saying there's no value in disciplinary work at all. Uh, in point of fact, people who do multidisciplinary things like I do can't do it in the absence of a very strong disciplinary setting, right? Even though my approach is different. Uh, I, ha I at some level in our education and in what I do, I count on the disciplines continuing to grow and flourish and develop and subdivide and, and so forth. Uh, secondly, people who work in disciplinary work certainly work on important problems. So I don't want to say, and I don't at all mean, that if you solve important problems, you do it in a multidisciplinary sense and uh, all the rest do disciplinary. What, what I've really come to believe is that we need to create an academic uh, culture that supports both those paradigms on equal footing. That, that we really need both, not um, turn all the disciplinary people into multidisciplinary people, and certainly not vice versa, uh, but we need to create that. And, and I think people feel much more comfortable in one versus the other. And, and if we Many people who are multidisciplinary, have multidisciplinary instincts, uh, function f effectively in a disciplinary setting. But that's, you have to ask whether or not they would be even more impactful if they had a multidisciplinary work. I mean, lots and lots of smart people who do work, you know, in spite of whatever barriers there are, and there are always barriers. Well, it may not be quite as important if you're, you know, a, a specialist in poetry. 
<laughs> yeah, so so it, it may be true that if you get out of the, the sciences and engineering and things like that, that um, that what I'm saying is less true, but but I bet if I were an expert in other areas, I, I, that I, th I think this is a general. There there are different ways of thinking. I have colleagues who are anthropologists, for example. Um, you mentioned poetry, and I won't. <laughs> I, I don't know, but uh, but and the arts tend to be more individual sometimes. But uh, anthropology, I think, struggles with this issue as much as scientists do. Um, so it, we can go back to the sort of um, um, sequential. <laughs> okay. Um, when you first got to MIT, can you talk a little bit about your first impressions? Maybe how it was different than Michigan State. So you know, at, at this point, it, it's hard to recall with great fidelity uh, and, and any certainty of accuracy how, how MIT felt when I first arrived. But what immediately jumps to mind uh, when, when, uh, when I think of those, those early years, uh, one is that MIT is much smaller in terms of numbers than Michigan State, but in many ways it felt much bigger. And, you know, I don't know if some of that is just you walk into a completely new uh, territory, and by then I was quite comfortable at Michigan State because I really have very few memories of what it felt like to leave for college. Um, but it may also have been a part of this is a world of fiercely independent people who are everybody's you know, as trying to head somewhere, uh, and I say that in a positive sense. And I come from the Midwest, which does have a certain um, social friendly culture that's outward. People here, people at MIT are very friendly, um, but but when I travel back to the Midwest, there's no question there's a, a somewhat different general feel uh, to that. Um, MIT is an incredibly exciting place to show up. I do remember feeling like I was handed, you can do what you want, you know, just figure it out, and which was part of what attracted me uh, here. But but it's also um, it's a major change from undergraduate school. I think that's a general comment about undergrad versus grad school uh, as well. Um, so talk a little bit about the your graduate experience um, for for your master's and doctorate and and how that sort of educational process felt different or or seemed new to you. Well, so when when you think about comparing undergraduate to graduate in experiences, sort of independent of institutions, um, an undergraduate experience is. Uh, largely driven by satisfying requirements that are laid out for you. There are some electives, and the degree to which they're electives are, depend on the institution and the area, but there's still a set number of credits or, or specific courses you have to take. So your roadmap is not entirely open. Graduate school, the explicit roadmap is mostly you have to pass your qualifying exams and you have to do a PhD thesis. And then there are a few course requirements there. Uh, and I'm, I'm exaggerating the differences some, but, uh, but not a whole lot. And, and so in a way that I personally hadn't really thought through is, okay, what, what do I really want to do? Where do I really want to work? And how do I find this out? And, and that is just not, not something I remember worrying about as an undergrad. Now that could be me and, <laughs> and, and that I was growing and it could be that it's a general case. But I think when I see even undergraduates at MIT becoming graduate students at MIT now, this, this is a big, big transition um, um, in those two, two ways of thinking. Um, in my graduate work, though, at MIT, I was very fortunate to be part of a small group of people that started the same PhD program. We were the first 
students in this HST PhD program uh, at that time, Building 20 still existed, so we all had this big office space, you know, it's just a big space with desks. And um, so the camaraderie that developed through that, even though we all took very different classes, um, at least our classes outside of the HST classes, uh, we, we had, uh, uh, you know, developed very, very close friendships, ones that I have, have to this day. Um, so in that sense, I think my graduate experience was incredibly positive compared to what some people I know still struggle with, um, where getting to know people is, it becomes more difficult. So um, when you finished your doctorate, um, how did you wind up deciding to do the postdoc work? And can you talk a little bit about that? Well, as, as, I, as I consider the end of my time uh, as, a, as a graduate student, um, I hope it's not heresy to say this, but, but I told many people, I'm never coming back to MIT. <laughs> you know, uh, this has been a wonderful N years, <laughs> and, um, but this is, a, this is a, uh, now it's time for life, right? Um, and, and I hadn't thought a lot about exactly what I wanted to do next. I considered, you know, for the first time in my life whether I should get an MD because I had done a lot of clinical work at that point. Um, considered academia, um, maybe partly burnt out. And uh, somebody I knew offered me a postdoc and it seemed really interesting. Uh, it was going from med school to a vet school and, and I, I thought there were many fascinating things about that that work, so I thought that was a logical, logical next step. Again, not not a whole lot of planning uh, that any more than my plan to go to undergrad or grad school. Um, uh, in the end, uh, when I was doing my postdoc and a faculty position became open here in HST, that and then I got the offer uh, that. You know, I said, forget it. I'm not going to do an MD. This is, I, I still think HST is the best thing ever. And um, I had many colleagues here that, uh, again, wonderful mentors that encouraged me along the way. And do you want to mention so. some of them? Well, let me come back to let me think okay. about how to <laughs> okay. how, how to do it. So. Um, so you didn't have to be away for very long before you decided it wasn't so bad here after well, all. Well, you know the thing there. <laughs> yeah. It is true. I didn't have to be away that long to decide uh, to, to the separation. Uh, it, it didn't make me say I was. Uh, my concerns about MIT life were groundless. But the real point is, where are the opportunities? And so um, I think timing is often an important issue. So the timing was fortunate, both in the, in the decision to come back. Uh, there was the possibility of a faculty position, which isn't always the case. And secondly, the laboratory of my postdoc moved from uh, Grafton, Massachusetts, to the middle of Long Island. And so that's a much, you know, I had to be uprooted one way or the other. And, and so it became a fork in the road in determining what to do. And the timing plus the in enormous opportunity, um, I thought uh, it's, it's worth a try. I don't know if I can succeed at this, but I truly believe it in, in my heart. And, and I was duly appointed in HST in electrical engineering, and I very much like my colleagues in electrical engineering computer science. So again, it's you reach the fork, uh, not because I planned it <laughs> so much as it seemed like the right decision to make at the time. I, I'm wondering if you can articulate the difference, how it, how it was different being at MIT as a faculty member when your previous experience had been as a graduate student. Yeah, so, you know, we've been talking about a number of the transitions from, 
you know, as, as I've moved from one position or institution to another. And uh, the move from being a graduate student to a faculty member is as large as undergraduate to graduate. Um, and the fact that I came back to the same place adds a whole other layer of complexity. The obvious layer of complexity is that if you, I was here as a student, people knew me as a student, you become a faculty. To some people, um, I'm still that student. It's not explicit, but um, but there there is is that, and the expectations and the mode of interaction stays the same. I wouldn't say that, I, to my knowledge, that was problematic. You know, most of it is how do you engage with people. What what I remember even more than that is that the students here, however, no, it's a big difference. I went from being one of them to on the you know the other. And so whereas before I was, you know, in addition to our many scientific discussions, which continued, the whole social infrastructure was dramatically different. I no longer knew, you know, was part of that, that uh, social culture um, of, of people that I had known well even, even a year ago. So, so that transition was more stark because I had been at this institution and they were people that I, I knew. Um, the other differences between being a, a graduate student and a faculty are probably completely obvious. You go from, it's up to me to decide exactly what I'm going to do in research. To some extent, I had done that as a graduate student, but you have a different la layer of protection. Um, I had to teach, um, and I hadn't really done any teaching before. And um, So, as this place is, it's the fire hose, and that fire hose exists at every single level, I think, uh, including becoming a faculty. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm a little uncertain how to address the, your various areas of interest, so maybe the best way is, can you sort of walk me through your career here and, and how your areas of expertise have connected over time, if they have. You think they have to connect. <laughs> well, maybe yeah, they yeah, don't. Yeah. You know, if, if I, when I think about what I've done in my career at MIT, they're, they're really sort of two buckets, and they are, to some extent, independent. Um, uh, so the one research bucket is, has been my work in arthritis. And um, where I've had a long-standing interest in uh, understanding how connective tissues that line your joints, like your knees and hips, uh, what makes them uh, 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 degenerate, uh, what makes them grow, do they repair, um, those kinds of questions. And in particular, whether or not mechanical forces like as might happen with certain forms of injury or forms of exercise or your personal anatomy, what role those plays, those uh, mechanical forces play in the development of your tissue and your risk for having degenerative uh, arthritic disease. Um, that, that area of interest actually got me into cartilage imaging. Um, so those are directly linked, and the, I got into cartilage imaging uh, largely because it was clear that the tools we had at our disposal to understand how they adapted to mechanical forces just weren't what they needed to be, especially uh, trying to understand what happens in real people. Yeah, so I have no idea what your, nobody knows <laughs> what your cartilage looks like and whether or not uh, it's in good shape or, or not in good shape. and, and in order to actually address the medical problem, we have to actually be able to assess whether you have it or not to, at some early stage. So before the imaging, the only way to know anything would be to open up someone's knee, for example, and yeah. look? So, so, from a, so there's sort of two, two contexts in which uh, I've been interested in understanding how cartilage is uh, degeneration might occur. So in the medical context, uh, which is fundamentally what we care about addressing, the, the, even today the way in which uh, a clinician uh, determines whether your joint is uh, in good shape is x-ray 
and you can't see cartilage on x-ray, but uh, if the bones are touching one another, you can presume there is no cartilage between them or if they're very close. Um, uh, you can also, if you happen to have an arthroscopic exam where they put a light pipe into your joint and then you can look directly uh, through that. And the other is complaints of pain. So if it really hurts, the presumption is that you have some tissue destruction. Not always the case, you have to rule out other things. So today, that's the gold standard clinically and that was the gold standard 50 years ago. Um, there's been some advances that allow you to look at cartilage directly and measure its morphology, but so far those have not really turned out to be any more sensitive to early prediction of disease, of, of degeneration. So you can tell when somebody has their joint nearly destroyed. Um, an underlying assumption in all that I'm saying is that if we want to prevent it or understand it, we need to turn the, we need to look much, much earlier than the point at which you've lost the tissue from the joint. At that point, the likelihood of repairing it, short of total joint replacement, I think, and most people would agree, it becomes much, much slimmer. The kinds of studies I was doing, you know, the, uh, initially were not clinically based, they were ex vivo, uh, so that meant we took pieces of cartilage out of animals, typically you can do it with human tissue, um, and keeping it alive in an incubator in the right kinds of conditions, and then we would apply mechanical forces and look and see what the cells did differently as a result of that. And the and, and there's, there's been lots of work of my own and many other people in the last 30 years looking at that question. The real challenge to that uh, scientific approach is the, um, the, ti is the time scale over which changes happen that we care about are weeks to months. And it becomes technically very, very challenging uh, for reasons I can go into. Uh, if you're interested, but it becomes very challenging to think about keeping tissue alive and and knowing what and understanding from that what happens in response to mechanical forces unless you can visualize it in a non-destructive way. So if I can take a, a picture of what the state of it is today and then tomorrow and next week and the week after, then I have a chance. But if I have to destroy it in order to measure it, then you have to have hundreds of samples and, and it's just technically very hard. So that's actually, it's those two sides that got me interested in, uh, in imaging. And I should, you know, in, We've talked again a lot about transitions and how we make decisions on what to do. So it wasn't that I sat in my office one day frustrated about what, you know, the difficulties I was having in doing the kinds of experiments I want, as frustrated as I was, but it was really a, an encounter with a colleague where I learned what you could do with imaging. Um, this was a colleague, also an HST uh, a colleague student, uh, had been an HST student with me, uh, who did cardiac imaging. And the techniques that she was using, I thought, oh, if I could do that in cartilage, that would, that would change the world. That would be very, very different. And so that, we, we got together and convinced people eventually to fund us, and, and that really started what we thought would be a five-year project, which is now 15 plus, <laughs> maybe almost 20 years. You, you mentioned that your areas of, of interest fall into two buckets, uh, so what's the second bucket? Okay, so the se second area of interest um, is, is not research per se, but it is uh, academic organizations in trying to create academic ecosystems that support and promote multidisciplinary uh, kinds of approaches, not just for research, but in education, um, and to do that with the backdrop of disciplinary institutions. So my 13 plus years of leadership in HST um, uh, certainly got me thinking about that, uh, about how do you create organizational structures that that really can enhance and enable that. And through, as a, an HST director, of course, I encountered lots of people that were thinking about the same things elsewhere and was increasingly called on to advise and even help create similar kinds of, of organizations. And, you know, 
again, it wasn't that I had this laid out plan when I started HST. I thought I would be running HST for six months, and but as I became part of it, I really began to understand the, you know, how it really worked and what, why I think the issues are foundational and and so forth. And I also saw how difficult it is to make it happen, even though uh, for me this was motherhood and apple pie and. Every, I couldn't imagine why everybody didn't try to make this happen. Um, and I also didn't understand until, uh, until trying to understand disciplinary structures better why it was hard. So as I became to understand that, I realized that this actually is, I don't know if it's so much an area of study, uh, but uh, an area of potential impact. Why, tell me why it's so difficult. <laughs> So, you know, it's reasonable to ask, you know, what, what is it that makes it so hard to, to create an academic entity that is multidisciplinary in the way I think? Um, and it has, to, has a lot to do with the culture that gets embedded in organizational structures. So with 400 years of development, or however long it's been, uh, the disciplinary approach has, has really emphasized the individual. It's emphasized your contribution to that discipline. Even if you work with others, uh, the question that gets asked in promotion uh, is, well, what was your contribution out of the 10 other people? Now, th there's some notable exceptions to this broad generalization, but um, uh, the, everything about how we think about who to admit as students, what to support in terms of who we hire as faculty, how we evaluate faculty, uh, all of those things, you know, are really framed in a disciplinary context. Now, in fairness, I think everybody at MIT and many other places will say, oh, we love multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. And, and so it's not that people don't acknowledge or believe that working together in collaboration is important, but nine times out of 10, these multidisciplinary collaborations are a division of labor, which is not the same thing as saying we are in it together. It's, you know, at the risk of putting a terrible, you know, it, it's like marriage, you know, you, you can't be both the man and the woman for a heterosexual marriage, but you better, begin to trust and understand to the best of your ability, and it is never perfect, what, what that other is to work together to do whatever you do. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And then and the, the evaluative structures, the hiring structures, the, you know, what you implicitly value, not what you write on paper, what you implicitly value is fundamentally different between an uh, disciplinary organization, multidisciplinary. And you, I don't think you can make people who think in disciplinary terms uh, uh, s magically become the people that uh, make the multidisciplinary happen. I don't actually think one organizational unit can do both of those things. Another thing I've thought about uh, quite a bit, that, that they really are valuing two different things. Related to that, that's part of the, at least in the medical context, many of the people you want under the tent for a medically multidisciplinary approach are people that are not necessarily even part of your own institution. So it mattered to us that we had physicians, even practicing clinicians that aren't necessarily scientists in the MIT you know, is very strong because people value the quality of the science and the engineering that happens here, right? That is, it's bread and butter, uh, at some level it's bread and butter claim to fame, right? Clinicians are not as innovative as they can be, they're not innovative in that same way, right? So it's very hard in an institution that's built on supporting that one thing to, to legitimately value the other. Now, as head of HST, I'm in a very different position, right? So there I can say, it's my role to value it, and it's part of our strategy, and it's part of our... But I have to do that in the context of recognizing that, you know, the head of biology may feel very differently about the value of that, as he should, 
right? So, so. Um, do you, do you think it's? I, I'm not. It's not either or. I guess. I mean, is it is it a lack of experience in the way people have been educated because it is sort of getting narrower and narrower as you get further in the academic process, or does it become an issue of ego? It, I think there are a lot of reasons that um, that that in addition uh, make it difficult to make it difficult to move to this being the norm. In some ways, one of the biggest is that there are not many examples of an HST-like structure. There are many examples of research institutes that include multiple disciplines, but they tend to be either structured differently or the promotion of the individuals is related to their disciplinary unit. But there really are not very many, if any, other academic organizations that cut across. So I, I think it's hard in the context of academia where a lot of what you do is compare your value to somebody else's. How do we compare HST to something else? And so um, I, I, in, in biology or electrical engineering, or pick any department here, some of, of the way they measure success and they is comparing themselves to other biology departments. Uh, there's some implicit, not explicit, but implicit understanding of what it means to be that unit, right? HST is embodied in the individuals here, but there's no sort of implicit uh, worldwide or nationwide view of what that means. And I think that probably is the single biggest challenge. It's one reason why, it's not the most important reason, but it is one reason why I've gotten involved in talking with other organizations about how to do it. I think if there were more around the world, it would strengthen MIT in this space. MIT's been a leader, you know, by having HST formed in 1970. It's remarkable, right? That was definitely a vision for the future. Right, but, but, and and it should be recognized for that leadership role. But that would be even more recognized if there were others around. So a form of criticism, for example, is if it's so great, why haven't the following, you know, why hasn't Stanford done it, or why hasn't, you know, which is I think an understandable statement. Um, but I think the reason they haven't done it is it's actually it's really hard to do it unless you think through what it means to create that kind of kind of organization. So uh, y y as director of HST, um, you transformed the organization pretty significantly. Can you talk about how it was when you um, first started as a faculty member and then how you sort of moved it into a model that you think works better, promotes interdisciplinary work in a better way. So um, when I took over as director of HST, we thought a lot about uh, how do we, how do we um, strengthen HST? Every organization can always be strengthened. How do we strengthen HST so that uh, it'll still exist 50 years from now? What are the things that um, need to happen? And, and it, so when I started HST, some of the people, some of the key players, were ones that had been part of HST from day one. That, so these were people that were my teachers uh, when I was there. And obviously that doesn't, isn't going to last <laughs> in perpetuity. Um, the, the, there were a couple you know, key areas that, that we addressed. One is that HST was mostly defined by the students. It had some, I think, 300-odd students at the time. Um, but it was created mainly by borrowing faculty from other departments. And I think it, it, it attracted those faculty 
you know, for reasons that varied over the years, but partly because they were unusual faculty in their own departments for their interest in medicine. So in 1970, there weren't very many people. It was unusual to be interested in health and medicine. Nowadays, uh, MIT is a transformed place itself in terms of the emphasis of health and medicine. So it just, he needed to evolve with that. Uh, uh, in, the, in that way. So I don't think in any academic organization is sustainable if you do it by borrowing faculty from others. Um, and for, for reasons that are, uh, I think, both obviously and completely understandable. Um, uh, it, you need a few changes in department heads be, when you have conflict between the, you know, the time demands on faculty that are nominally part of one department and we're borrowing them for another, for example. And that's completely uh, appropriate <laughs> for them to have con you know, concerns and it makes it impossible for somebody running HST. So one was to build, build a faculty. Um, the, the, in terms of building the faculty in a way that supported the objectives, um, it was clear that building a faculty that were made up only of people that were only appointed in HST would only serve to create something that was not multidisciplinary because you can't possibly cover all disciplines and professions in one unit. So we spent a lot of time with, fac with people who were principals in HST at the time thinking about how do we build a faculty structure that actually provides uh, values people who may be appointed in other departments and actually in to the extent possible, pays them for their time, um, so that we could have a multidisciplinary um, kind of faculty. So one of the big changes in HST between when I started and, and when I finished was when I began, there were five people with primary appointments in HST, uh, most of whom had been there for a long time, and there were about 200 affiliated faculty who had no real explicit role to a very, very different structure, including the, and processes to support the structure that had a faculty that included primary and dual, meaning they're appointed in two departments and joint, which is a complicated version. Of course, Harvard and MIT have different names for these things, but um, so that was our faculty, and they were. Uh, uh, they were evaluated, they were evaluated by committee, they were evaluated up the line at each institution um, so that they were legitimized, uh, if that's a word, um, in their role. And had fac you know, you can't have faculty meetings with five, you can't run an organization with 300 students with five faculty, you need real faculty. So, so we moved to a faculty of about 60 in that way, including hiring about 13 new people. And, and maintained affiliated faculty who do some things like our clinical teaching. So we, we changed both structurally and in terms of the, the people that were there. The average age dropped by probably, I didn't figure it out, but it had to have dropped by at least 30 years. Um, uh, and that, of course, brings, brings important new positive energy into the organization. So the faculty was probably the biggest change uh, that, that that I think I made as part part of HST and as everything else in some ways followed uh, followed from that. You don't do anything without faculty and colleagues. So I can tell you, I did it. But really, I, I was part of a big team of of absolutely amazing people that that believed as much as I do in the value of this kind of organization and made it happen. So it sounds to me like a lot of what you're talking about in terms of creating an environment that supports true multidisciplinary problem solving has to do with money in that, um, you know, if you have sort of an affiliation with an organization but you're not really paid by that organization, most of your effort's not going to go in that direction. But if you're part of the organization and paid by that organization and acknowledged for your value to it, then your commitment would be greater, the time spent would be greater, and all of that. So, um, you know, I, I did mention that that with people who are part of the organization, we want to pay them for it. That's, um, 
it is not completely to say that paying some, it's all about money, that paying somebody for that role is, um, is all that it takes, right? So it, it is about money to the extent that there's an expectation that people are supported for the work they do, which includes a salary. And there's also a recognition that if somebody splits their time with mul multiple loyalties, that um, if somebody else is paying their full salary uh, and, and we don't have some other kind of arrangement, that, that that's a setup for a challenge down the line. It may work out initially because there's um, some common values. So I wouldn't say it's, so, so money is a piece of it, but as just as important as the money was the process and the way in which it was, uh, the, the process for appointment, uh, which involved a conversation with, uh, you know, so the, the, backing up, the, the people that were part of HST primarily, is, it's straightforward. It's like you would expect in any department. So the, the trickiest people are ones that are appointed primarily in another department. Okay, so the process through which they were appointed, uh, if they weren't, if they were already here, involved conversation with their department head. It involved often shared things that led to that department benefiting through HST's effort, just as it benefited HST. So those kinds of conversations took place, and in some cases, it involved us supporting part of their salary. So uh, you know, partnerships work because they're valued by both both parties. So they had to work at the faculty level, but they had to work at the organizational level as well. The value that that came to me as head of HST or came to HST might not have been identical to the value that went to the other unit, but it was as much my job to make sure the other unit felt value as it was that other unit's job to see that we, we got value. So we had those, you know, it, it really is, the fundamental premise is what makes partnerships work. Right, which is more than is absolutely more than money, and so there is some ego involved in there, this. There is absolutely there. There is ego involved, and there's there's also you know we were helped tremendously by the vision of HST. You know they if if you people in other units very often you know really were wanted this kind of academic community in order to thrive. They felt this is how they thrive. They thrive because they have students like this, because they're next to colleagues that they otherwise wouldn't, you know, be on committees with and meet, especially young people. You know, once you get old, you also know a lot of people, and the organizational structures don't matter as much in terms of your networking. But when you're young, that's, how, that's actually a primary way in which you end up in meeting people and going in new directions. So we provided a very different kind of academic community to, to faculty who were part of disciplinary units. And, and so, so if we had handed somebody money who actually didn't value that, it wouldn't, it, it would, they would have taken the money maybe, but it wouldn't have valued us at all. So you know, to, to some extent, uh, you know, ego has to be a part of it, but, uh, but that's not the first word that comes to my mind. It's how do we enable somebody who really values this and, um, and then create expectations that say they have to help make it happen as well. So if we go back to the two buckets yeah. of the, <laughs> the, the, the research in, in um, arthritis and in imaging techniques mm -hmm. and then in this sort of how do you set up a true multidisciplinary um, research facility. Um, can you can you tell me as as you look at those two areas what accomplishments you feel the best about? You know, if I think about the accomplishments I feel the best about. Um, I'm not sure I'd articulate them, articulate them in the context of the two buckets per se. So I feel the best in many ways uh, about people. So I'm very, very proud of many of the faculty, of all the faculty that we recruited from outside to this institution, who I think are wonderful assets and um, and 
you know, what little role I can play in, in helping them launch their career and then have their impact, I feel uh, very, very good about that. Um, and same way for the students that I've had in my group, which would be, and the colleagues I've worked with in my group that have enabled us to, to, do, to do things. So in some ways, the most important thing we do in terms of impact is the people. And I, faculty told me that when I was a student. I didn't believe it. But I mean, I didn't. It sounded gratuitous. And, and now I find myself, at, at the end of the day, what, where do you say, I feel really good about what I did. And, and that's it. There are probably 100 different strategies that could have led to that same outcome. And I picked one or two, whatever. But um, that's actually far and away what I feel best about. I wonder if you talk just a little bit about some of the um, programs that were created while you were director of HST, like um, the Biomedical Enterprise Program. Um, so, uh, you know, I said before that the the number one thing I worked on in HST was was building faculty, but we did build a number of, of programs as well as well, um, and. Uh, in, in some ways, one of the most interesting was the Biomedical Enterprise Program. And uh, a, a thumbnail sketch of that, that program is to uh, bring in individuals who are interested in having an impact in health and medical sciences, but to do it through enterprise, through big business, small business. And the uh, underlying premise is that traditional training for these students, say an MBA, tended not to include the very un many unique things that are associated with developing a biomedical device or a drug or a uh, biological of some sort, um, number one, and both in regulatory terms but also in terms of the ultimate recipient of that advance, whether direct or indirect, which is to say the patient. Um, so this is a program that was actually modeled on the PhD program. It brought in, in people with a business interest, as I said, but put them in the same classroom with our graduate students and our medical students. Um, it gave them an opportunity to interact with patients, which, I, by the way, I don't believe I mentioned that on the PhD program, the second thing <laughs> that, that was the clincher is that as a PhD student I had to take care of patients and there's no better way to understand what that experience is really like than to go in and do it. Not because you want to be a clinician but if you want to understand this the real world as it were on that being there there's not no no classroom can replace that. Similarly for these uh, business students we said if you want to understand the way in which clinicians make decisions, the way in which patients dis make decisions, how that whole encounter is structured, you got to go there and you have to see it. So they had a, a designed experience at Mass General uh, where they did that. So this attracted a very um, interesting and, and spectacular uh, group of students. They received, uh, if they didn't already have an MBA, they received an MBA uh, from Sloan and, and the, and master's from HST as a dual degree. Um, the, um, it was an experiment in saying, can we take the model of the PhD program, apply it to a somewhat different and new paradigm, and come up with a curriculum? Now, there are many, many things I would continue to improve about the curriculum, but, but the fundamental structure, I think, has proven to be, to be very sound. The, the more HS, so I told you why we created BEP, uh, our acronym for Biomedical Enterprise Program, for the students and for the world. From an internal point of view for HST, a lot of the reasons people want to be part of HST is they want to solve problems in human health. In order to solve many problems in human health, they have to be translated. They need to connect eventually through some business enterprise. and. Even though I personally felt that was a perfectly legitimate career path for our PhD and our MD students to take, they had really no exposure, and certainly no exposure through HST, to people that thought about how to do that. And 
Um, so by creating BEP and putting it under the umbrella of HST, it valued, it created a sense that we valued that as much as we valued becoming a clinician or becoming a bench scientist. And I had MD students and PhD students use phrases like, oh, I felt like now I could come out of the closet because I was really interested in taking what I'm working on and carrying it through, right? So, and, and so companies have formed between PhD students and our BEP students and the conversation has changed and the faculty enjoy having a whole different kind of questions come up in, in the classroom. One of the most powerful things actually about putting the, in the classroom, about putting these multiple disciplinary students together is they really learn more from each other. Not necessarily content, but they learn the values through the questions that are asked. So business students ask and are, you know, different f types of questions on average than a science student. Um, so that was a major program, and involved, and, and in putting it together, we engaged people from the local business community. They teach some of the classes. They were actively involved in, you know, the many discussions we had about how to create the program. Something that is also very unusual in academic circles. There's usually a pretty big divide between the business sector and the academic sector, except in sort of boutique kinds of, of courses. But they, they were part of the process from the beginning, and I think that helped uh, make it work. So, well, so, what I'm hearing from HST is you can show the value of the um, approach from the students that you attracted, from the outcomes that happen. And um, so it sounds to me that if Stanford hasn't done it, it's not because it's not successful, it's because of the difficulty. Yeah, so, you know, there, there are many ways to, you know, illustrate the value of this approach. You know, the number of students, is what's, what, the students that are attracted are spectacular and that's become widely acknowledged. Uh, and they've gone on and done amazing things and in some cases transformed uh, medicine. So I think when people consider whether or not they can do it, it's not that they don't look at this and say, we, we would love to see this happen. Um, it's, it's a combination of being unwilling to go the full, uh, the full way uh, of saying, let's put all these disciplines into one place. They'll say, let's create our MD program like HST, or let's create our PhD program, HST, completely missing the key point that really what makes it work is putting them in the same classroom. It's not, it's not the teachers alone or the curriculum alone. And the second is creating a cultural infrastructure that fully supports it. Um, it just requires uh, incredible tenacity. Um, uh, and it to must put still together. be evolving. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. And you know, uh, the. Um, I often get asked, so what areas do you work on? How do you define what, what HSC should be? What research areas sh should they do? Because we aren't building a specific research center. We're creating a community. At the same time, you have to be able to point to things and say, what are you doing? And, and with our faculty distributed. So one of the ways in which we have evolved institutions was creating these things we called research nuclei. And those are, rel those are now in existence about five or six years. Um, and so this meant creating a critical mass of people at specific locations. Uh, like imaging was primarily located at Mass General Hospital under the Martino Center, which was enabled by a big gift, but coupled to that, the structure and the concept of a nucleus. So everybody there felt like they're part of HST, you know, at least part of an HST center. So I think those kinds of strategies carried out um, uh, give some opportunities for other people to emulate and maybe with that may have an easier time making it happen. And how about the creation of um, the mentoring program, Biomatrix? Um, so an, another uh, a really fun program uh, that, uh, that we created, um, I've forgotten how many years ago now, uh, uh, we called Biomatrix, one of my colleagues was the creator of that name. And the, um, uh, I was interested in it for a couple of reasons. Number one, HST is a graduate student only organization. We don't have any, or institute, we don't have any undergrads. And, and so 
MIT is really a, you know, being involved in the undergraduate experience is an important part, I think, of our responsibility at, at MIT. Um, the solution for HST, I don't think, is or certainly was to create an undergraduate degree program. On the other hand, one thing HST can do, partly because it didn't have any uh, um, undergraduate program is say, there are a hundred ways you can have an impact on medicine. You could do it through biology, you can do it through electrical engineering, you can do it through chemical engineering, you can do it through what, whatever undergraduate training you want. And so uh, what, what we really sought to do was to create a community for undergraduates in which, you know, their horizons were expanded so they didn't feel that in order to impact medicine, they had to become an MD or they had to, had to do one department or another, that really they should, f you know, follow their, their path and, and there are just examples upon examples of virtually any path you can imagine. So it was set up to, to try to do that. And it wasn't specifically about creating people who were MDs, you know, there are many MD organizations for that, uh, or about bioengineering, there's organizations for that. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I wonder, c can you describe, so the, the, the classroom environment, when you have um, multidisciplinary students, how is it different than um, a classroom where you've got, you know, all biology majors? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one question I get asked often is, how do you actually teach students if they come from all of these backgrounds? You know, I'm in, in a class on molecular biology, human molecular biology and genetics. We've got people in the class, that some of whom are pursuing a PhD in, in molecular biology, and then we have a mechanical engineer, right, who presumably does not have a comparable background in that. Um, and uh, let me say three things about what, what we have to do in terms of supporting that, that kind of course. One is we felt adamantly that you still want those same people in the room. If you start dividing people up about what they, for, about what they know previously and, and creating, you know, molecular biology for dummies and molecular biology for those with experience, you've erased the real value in putting these communities together. Uh, it requires that the faculty who are teaching the courses be absolutely comfortable with the fact that they've got this broad range of expertise and find creative ways to use it. It also means that you have to place expectations on the students that may not be as up to speed, that they better find a way to learn it. They're about to become professionals. They're not going to learn everything through a course. That they've got to find. They they have to be expected to find ways to figure it out. And maybe the more senior students help. You know, we there are various approaches that have been put in place. It works because the people that know the most are not the same people as they go through the curriculum. So those people that may be struggling to catch up in one area are the ones that actually are the authorities in another area. So if, so if the faculty don't try to teach to the lowest common denominator, and that is a disaster for everybody, uh, if they just take that, then, then it works from that standpoint. The payoff tends to be that the nature of the discussion in these classrooms is unlike in a very narrowly defined classrooms. You know, the classic story about the person who knows nothing asking a penetrating question out of complete naivete at, does happen. So faculty will come in and give guest lectures and they'll say, that was one of the most interesting lectures I've ever given. I got better questions than I get when I go to a scientific meeting, you know. And I know that some of the students asking them are, you know, sort of feeling sheepish because, like, I know somebody, I'm sure this answer is obvious and I'm an idiot, but can you just help me understand this, right? So it, uh, and, and part of that is where people develop the trust and the comfort in living in that environment. So uh, it's surprising how many things we think are absolutely known that are actually not necessarily really known. They're just part of our current framework. Um, 
So can you can you fold this all into um, a discussion about the um, the Vamp Engineering Center? I don't want to hear about Vamp. No, it's too boring. <laughs> like, let me see. It's <laughs> so long ago now. Um, or maybe just you know what's happened, how it's developed in the last ten years. Yeah. So you know, very early in in my my time as head of HST, we got involved with a, a number of institutions uh, led by Vanderbilt in a project called VANTH, uh, which is the acronym for all the institutions, but it was an engineering research center around educational technologies for biomedical engineering. So that long-winded title, um, the, the, the real goal was to see if we could develop advanced educational tools that, um, that could be used in, in a classroom in medical, medical school or bioengineering uh, to make it easier to teach the concepts that were fundamental to say physiology uh, or other areas that are relevant to, to bioengineering. Um, so we, we talked earlier about, about how do you deal with a very diverse population uh, in the classroom. And one of the realities is that you don't want everybody to know everything in gory detail. What you really want in a classroom is to help them develop a framework and a, and a, a sense, set of intuitions you know about how things are that if they really need to know whether you're the expert or not if you get to the point where you have to go to find detail you actually start exploring it yourself but what you can do in a classroom is help to get the instincts right so educational technology is one way in which you have a chance to allow people to develop those instincts so we tend in real life to develop those instincts by playing with things by building things and seeing them fall apart by you know, various forms of hands-on or non-hands-on experimentation. So with educational technology, if you set it up right, you should be able to create these safe environments, simulation, for example, that allow students to play with different parameters of a model or uh, of how the kidney works, for example, and, and get intuition. So, but, and it, those kinds of things happen all the time. We've had them in HST from the beginning, but the problem is they're built by one individual, and as soon as that person retires or the equipment breaks or something like that, you're back to square one. So doing it in a way that makes it as much a part of the educational experience as a textbook would be or as a web course these days would be was the vision of Vanth. Can we bring people together that understand how people learn so it was also a multidisciplinary group, how people learn, what educational technology tools are there, what's the domain expertise, putting them all in the same room with the goal of creating sustainable infrastructure and sustainable tools that provide that intuition. So the, the project itself was uh, eight years. It, it's a 30-year project. So it, it's worked on in bits and pieces since the NSF mandated an eight-year drop dead time. So we're all still work on it and we all still communicate. But it's, you know, and, and there have been some wonderful advances to our classes, but, uh, but it's a long way before you can say, I can point to this, this artifact and say, say we've gotten there. So that's a work in progress still. Um, I, I guess in some ways I think that you're, you're sort of uniquely situated because so much of your thinking about teaching has changed from when you started to the way you approach it now. And I wonder if you could talk about how that's changed um, and how you see, or how would you describe what you think is really good teaching now? So you're asking about teaching per se, not education more um, generally. Um, I, I guess I'm not thinking of them as being all that separate. Uh, the, the changes that, that you've made in terms of how you approach the classroom environment and, and why you've made those changes. So one, one of the... Um, one of the things that Vanth, the Vanth Project in particular um, uh, taught me and really opened my eyes 
uh, was to a huge body of work about how people learn that had been developed primarily for the K through 12 um, uh, group of students, but that I think is equally relevant to anybody <laughs> learning it at any age. And uh, um, in retrospect, and even at the time, uh, the specifics that we learned are very intuitive, right? One is that we learn through mistakes. The second is, is there's a huge, um, I should say mistakes appropriately managed. There's a, there's a huge difference between what a professor thinks they teach and what students learn, if you're not careful. Um, so teaching is not equivalent to learning. And third is that uh, teachers can learn a lot about what their students learn f from their misconceptions, not from the right answers, but from when you see how, what wrong answers they come up with and how did they do it. What's changed, I think, most in my own personal teaching is that learning experience happening at the final exam isn't useful to me or to the students. It's much better if on an ongoing basis in the classroom, we set, a set I, I or whoever sets up mechanisms to understand where the students are at, at any point. And there are lots of strategies to do that. But because what you learn is when you see the mistakes they make, then that influences what you then teach. So to a degree, I never it wouldn't have occurred to me as a starting faculty where I did lectures like everybody else. Whether I'm teaching electrical engineering students or medical students, I'll often put problems in, you know, and and ask them to write it on a piece of paper, and you know, and they have fancy electronic versions of this, and um, and and use that as the basis for deciding what I do next. It requires some flexibility. Um, uh, because sometimes people are way more confused than I could have imagined, and I have to sometimes have to come back and say, I'm going to teach this again, but i got to think about it, and I'll teach you next time, that, uh, clearly. But, but I think that process of finding ways to reveal where your students actually are and addressing it at that level. Again, very intuitive, but not, uh, not the way I thought about teaching uh, <laughs> when I started as a faculty. Yeah, because it's sort of different, uh, the difference between top down and bottom up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you still have to, you still have to provide some top down structure, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the kinds of things you're, you're expecting them to know. Um, but again, what, what I might lecture on has nothing, it may have, you hope it has a relationship to what they learn, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, and it's surprising, the other thing that's, again, it shouldn't have been surprising, but, but I'm always surprised when I see it, is how much people who get the right answer learn from seeing the wrong way people do it. Because some people get the right answer for the wrong reasons. Um, and so. Um, do you, MIT students are sort of a unique group. Do you have a description you could give of, you know, how you see a typical MIT student? You know, working work, MIT students are amazing. They're wonderful. Um, uh, they're, uh, you know, they, they come with a you know, a depth of skills that, that even though I'm a professor here, I look at some of what these students can do and have done, and I sit in awe of that. And having them in the classroom, you know, is, um, it's, it's, I'm obviously having trouble expressing it in words, but it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to describe, describe to somebody. And they, they um, you know, they have all the things you expect this age group to have, right, uh, in terms of challenges of m moving from home to, to college and developing social skills and growing up. And, you know, in this sense, they're entirely normal on, you know, on average and maybe more normal than some people perceive. Some IT has a certain perception. But, but the, um, they are just so smart. And, 
and I would say in, in biometrics I've really gotten a chance to get to know some students really well and their drive to make a difference in the world is um, inspiring right you know so sometimes it, it's going to be really hard for them to do what they want to do because making a difference is hard but but they they are so passionately committed and um, and willing to knock down your door if if you think if they think you could help and um, and that's it keeps me young so I don't know the perhaps the only <laughs> statement is MIT students keep me young um. uh, You've been, you know, involved in the um, the translational health science and technology program in India, um, and I guess I, I I'd like you to talk just a bit about um, what the goals of that association are, what difference you hope yeah. it will make. So one of the things I've, I've done um, much of my time since stepping down from HST has been focused on is developing or working with others to develop the Translational Health Science Technology Institute in India. This is a, a project that um, grew out of my last few years as head of HST. Um, uh, initially because I was approached by the uh, a team of people that came from the Indian government and from uh, other institutions in India that were talking to uh, different institutions about how you brought engineering and medicine together and HST was an obvious model for them to consider and um, after they explored this they um, they thought this is a model that Number one, they thought they really needed to have in India and uh, that, that they thought they needed to create a new institution to do it. And so one thing led to another and I became <laughs> principally involved in, in that project. For me, the, uh, this, uh, so, so the, the goal of the project is to create an ec a f a institution that is modeled on HST that puts engineers and physicians and scientists and maybe business people together in a single academic institution with different kinds of relationships that are networked across India and possibly the world, um, starting from scratch. They made the decision uh, on the recommendation of many that, uh, they, that it would not be successful if they tried to embed it into existing institutions, that, that the likelihood of changing those institutions to accept and to build that was slim to none um, because the difference between disciplines and professions is even more stark in India. For me it was interesting, number one, because I'm interested in how do you create these organizations and, and we need more of them, um, but also because increasingly there are students that want to uh, approach problems um, uh, of the underprivileged in third world countries. And I don't believe that students or any faculty can approach these problems without partners in those parts of the world. And uh, those don't just happen overnight. So by being part of creating this institution, it's already clear we've created relationships that can support our own students where that's the context. We will not solve those problems by focusing only on Boston by living in Boston, you actually have to go see it. So that combination of things is what got me interested in it. But the goal is audacious, <laughs> create a new institution with a fundamentally, radically different culture um, than, than currently exists in India. And, and what's the status right now? So um, my primary official role is to help recruit and then train the faculty. Uh, for the institution, so we've had a faculty search the last year and have are in the midst of trying to recruit them. You know, we've found them. We had a joint search between a U.S.-based people and Indian-based people. Um, so, trying to recruit the founding faculty, um, we are still in search of a director of the institute, and and I think that's a that's an impediment to having it uh, grow very quickly. We, we definitely need that. Ground has been broken. They've got space for this uh, in outside Delhi. Um, the, the mental framework and the, um, for 
uh, India has now moved to a cluster model. So this is one institution of several that are to be co-located so that it doesn't stand in isolation. And so the whole concept of how do you build a cluster, and that's, that's something that's happening in India but affects us. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very much at the early stages. Um. Um, I, I want to move on to some MIT-specific questions, but I, I think before I sort of leave the research and teaching area, um, I wonder if there's anything you'd like to say about where you see your research headed um, or where you see HST headed or... Um, you know, in terms of saying where do I see my research headed, uh, my research in arthritis headed, um, th uh, the biggest challenge at the moment um, uh, for arthritis work is uh, disseminating, translating the our imaging technology and other potentially other forms of imaging technology to widespread use um, until. Tech. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that I said, but we were able to develop an imaging technology that allows you to actually see key macromolecules in the cartilage, which tell you something, not necessarily everything, about about the status of the tissue. In order to see whether or not that's useful at all clinically, which would be our dream, you actually have to use this technology and lots of people across lots of cohorts and lots of institutions, lots of medical institutions. For that to happen, it can't be uh, a home, it, it has to be installed in uh, existing imaging technology, which has just happened now with with one vendor, uh, and then those studies have to happen. That's not something that I can do myself. So at some level, what really has to happen next has to be done by, by somebody other than me, and my role can be advocacy um, uh, on that. Um, there's a couple of other areas that now that we have this technology that bring me back to my roots of trying to understand really what matters to these little cells inside cartilage and what do they care about the mechanical environment. Um, again, I thought I'd be doing that 15 years ago, but here we are back. So, so that's, that's part, of, part of what's next on the, on the cartilage side. Um, you know, for, for me, uh, the, the HST and more generally um, the side of my life which has become the more dominant side of trying to uh, create exemplars of this multidisciplinary ecosystem. Um, that That's really what I'm spending a lot of time working on and thinking about, partly and mostly through example, um, and India and, and other places, with the hope of being able to distill that into things like written documents and white papers and working with an anthropologist to do some of that. Okay. So um, y you were the first woman at, M at MIT to lead an academic science or engineering department. And um, I I'm curious to know what kind of, how that experience um, felt to be inside or, or whether it made a difference um, whether it was easy, whether it was difficult. So I, I do get asked often, you know, what's it like to be a woman at MIT? What was it like to, uh, you know, to be a woman department head at, at MIT? Uh, the, uh, and and I've, I've asked people that, <laughs> that I know at other institutions, but uh, it's extremely difficult to know what it would have been like had I been a different person, a different gender, a different... So, you know, what was it like? Um, you know, I, I, it, it's hard to answer in any concrete way what it's like. But it, it did, uh, you learn a lot about yourself when you do these kinds of leadership positions, about what you care about, what you're willing to stand up for. You learn a lot about other people. Um, and, and uh, you know, I would say I, I grew tremendously um, as, a, as a person as a result of that experience through meeting 
wonderful people and being able to do wonderful things and also you know <laughs> like everything there were things where I you know there were challenges that I had to figure out how to face um, you know perhaps the the only thing I can really say about being a woman is is that um, my husband and I developed a way to talk about that um, I, I found that sometimes I'd come home and I'd say you know I just the it's never what's going well. It's, of course, what you're struggling with. And I'm struggling with this, that, and the other thing. And he would say, oh, just do X or just do Y. And they, they would be things that, you know, just, I'd, <laughs> I'd be like, what? <laughs> or if someone's, I mean, I'm dealing with this person, they say, oh, they're going to say this. And I'd be, what? So, so we developed this phrase, and he says, you know, Martha, you have to remember that this is ice hockey, not ice dancing. So the background for that was that, you know, we, we do come with these schemas in the way we think. And so he started to call my paradigm ice dancing. You know, it's hard, it requires skill, and it's beautiful, and, you know, you move around the ice and you can be injured and blah, 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 right? And then using the same equipment to first order, there's ice hockey. You move around, it takes skill, but you get slammed into the boards, and that's part of the game. And, there's, and if you're doing ice dancing, you don't expect ice hockey. So you know, this is not, it. I, I suspect that my colleagues were equally perplexed <laughs> at me as sometimes I was at them, and probably because they thought it was <laughs> the other. Um, I, I would say being, it made me even more passionate about thinking about how to promote diversity in general, about what really, it, that, that it, it, it is not about somebody explicitly saying, I don't want women or I don't want minorities. I, I, in my experience, I've never seen something that outrageous like that. It's much more subtle, and it's uh, the, the ways in which these biases enter, and they absolutely do enter. So as far as being a woman, I, as, a, as a student, I didn't believe there was any difference. I thought the problem was solved. Students today think the same thing. It is not solved, but it's not and I think people are genuinely trying to find ways to work on it. When I think about building THSTI, by the way, I'm thinking we we want to get a, a distribution of disciplines and we want a dis distribution of genders when we start, because I think if you can start that way, it's a hell of a lot easier than trying to uh, t to fix it <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Um can you or, uh, can you expand a little bit about the the more subtle ways in which um, bias comes across? Because I think a lot of people really don't um, don't really understand what that means. What that means. So you know, first first of all, I think most of the th ways in which the consequence of the bias tends to be very small. I mean, a number of people have talked about this, but it, it's not any one thing. It's the cumulative effect of the of little things uh, of bias, you know, whether it's for gender or something else. Um, I think one of the most um, sobering studies I've read on this is one where um, uh, uh, manuscripts and grants uh, were sent to reviewers. And the only difference in what was sent was the names of the authors or the principal investigator to obviously women or obviously male or neutral. And it was sent to women and men reviewers. So in fields that were, say, more male dominant men and women gave significantly or statistically significantly lower scores or reviews to papers that were or proposals that were written by women. So this is the exact same content. I don't believe that they picked people who were purposely biased, right? So, you know, I think that's when I say it's subtle. I think we all come with a set of biases and we rarely know what they are. And so it requires just really being open to the fact that, and I, I'm sure I come with them too, right? So be open to the fact that we carry those biases and it's, I think, through collective thinking 
with diverse groups that you have a chance of, you know, maybe balancing out the biases. Um, right. Be easy to fix that by just removing names and having them. Well, so the, exa reviewed. the example I gave, yes, but you can't do promotions that way. You can't write promotion letters that way, and. And so, you know, the things that people, many, many people talk about are ones that if you start becoming sensitive to it, you, you notice in things like promotion letters, the phraseology that's used about women, you know, is, tends to be different than the phraseology used about men. Um, you know, they work, uh, she works really hard. Really, she works very hard. She's very dedicated. And, um, about the guy they might say you know he is tenacious he goes after a problem and he till he gets it solved that's of course working hard right but they they send very very different messages in the context of an evaluation letter right so to me an, a lay person reading those would probably say they're both great letters right right does that make sense no. yes <laughs> Um, so when you, you know, you have the perspective of being a graduate student here and, and a faculty member, and so at, at mid-career, can you, can you talk about some of the changes that you've seen at MIT? And Why are you think? calling my mid-career now or when I... <laughs> I I'm calling you mid-career now. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> I think I'm on the last... Heard of it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I mean, I I interviewed yeah. Jay Forrester, yeah, okay, who's yeah, ninety two. Yeah, 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 so yeah, okay. you by may that, have by more that, time. By that. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so you know, my I've been at MIT for thirty years. In in some ways, I know the institution much better, and in in that way, I see it differently than initially. And in other ways, it's changed profoundly. So perhaps the most overt way it's changed profoundly is its whole thinking about the life sciences. So at the time I came to MIT, life sciences was for those guys at Harvard, to first order, right? I mean, there are people here, but it really was not at all part of the ethos. I think now you will find people that are concerned that the pendulum has swung too far the other way, that we've made a tremendous investment in the life sciences, which is a place I, by the way, I do think MIT has a, an import, hugely important role to play, but, um, but it shouldn't be a life science institute. So, so that's been a profound change that at some level has been directly related to my, my life at MIT. There's no question it's more diverse. I think I was the twelfth engineering woman faculty, which I didn't know at the time when I was hired. It's some small number, which I'm glad I. I think I'm glad I didn't know. And I mean, now there's there's many. I, I mean, I used to know all the women on the faculty. I I should make it my business to know them, but I don't. I don't yet. Um, it. Um, I, Have the students yeah. changed? You know, the, 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 there is a, the, so the way stu students, I, uh, g as generations change, I think that gets re reflected in the student body at MIT. Uh, so I have a perception, I don't know if I were going to be very scientific about it, whether it would be um, borne out in reality. But I would say I've been struck in the last uh, five plus years uh, the degree to which incoming students, uh, graduate students and undergrads, come with an idea of changing the world, of, of thinking globally. I, I don't remember that being some things people wrote about in their application essay or talked about in application interviews. Um, so either, either we've changed and therefore that's who I see, or there's a, a more of a generational this is reflecting a more of a generational change. Um, and uh, you know, who knows what the next generation will be. There's never a shortage of things for people to do and have impact on, but that seems to be the, something that's much more prevalent now. Um, do you have a sense when you think about MIT nationally or, or globally, um, what it is that, that makes MIT unique? 
you know, when I, 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 when I, when I'm in India, for example, I, I hear many comments about people's perception of MIT, um, as well as other places in in the nation, and. Um, you know, if I try to synthesize what it is I think people say, it's recognized clearly as being a place of innovation. They look at this as the pinnacle of, you know, of, of where people who are innovative come, <coughs> and they'll ask, what is it that you do? What's in the sauce at MIT that makes it happen? I don't think it's only MIT. I think it's the ecosystem, but, uh, but, but certainly this is a very creative place, and it's perceived that way. And it's also perceived for its strength, technically, that you know, this is where radar was invented. And, and those things remain the kinds of things that you hear people uh, talk a lot about. It is, it is very highly valued uh, outside. Um, it's always nice to hear that, of course, being, <laughs> being part, part of, uh, of MIT. Are there particular characteristics that, that you think the Institute has that makes it so innovative? Like, why yeah. here and nowhere else? Uh, you know, so, so when uh, trying to th think about what it is here at MIT that makes it such an amazing, innovative cauldron, um, uh, you know, I, d I don't think it's the only place in the in the country or the world that has an awful lot of innovation happening, and I think it would be at MIT's peril to to think oh, we're on top. <laughs> um, we 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 will stay there, um, but uh, you know, uh, this is this is a place where pretty much if you want to get something done and you're passionate about it, you can get it done. Yeah, it's not universally true, and of course, and there's different personality differences can make that easier or harder. But, but I would say, even from my days as a student, you know, you can do what somebody tells you to do here, but, but you, there is a real openness that I think does not happen in lots of institutions that says, if you want to drive it and you want to make it happen, whether you're a student or a faculty or a staff person, um, you can do that. And, and there is a, um, people that, at every level, in general, are highly valued. Um, it's not so much of a, it's not a class system. And if you're, and this is again, none of this is universal, and it's highly personal. But I think those things tend to be huge enablers. That um, that, it, and if you do something, you'll be recognized for it. Again, doesn't always happen, but but I think it's important for MIT to actually do that <laughs> because that generates people who really try to make things happen. Um, and it's ensconced in an incredible ecosystem uh, in Boston, right? And and I I don't think we can set you, if you picked up the entire institution and moved it, you know, into the middle of the desert, right? Even with air conditioning, <laughs> without any of that, I I think it would dissipate because um, that adds enormously to the vibrancy of the place. But you know, this is a question so many people want to answer: of, of what what is it that you do institutionally that makes makes it the way it is? And you know, in the it, partly it's the people and the people who generate that culture. But it's the leadership that has to continue to make sure that they pay attention to that culture and that they attract those kinds of people, um, which I think all department heads try to do. It, what if I ask you specifically about um, the School of Engineering? What do you think its chief strengths are? You know, so I've, one of the benefits of being head of HST is, and, well, I mean, this would be true for any department head. As I said, I got to know many, many departments, right, both in engineering and science and at Harvard, at the hospitals, just by virtue of me doing my job. But in particular, I spent a decade sitting on engineering council, which is where all the department heads in engineering make. And, uh, yeah. You know, again, it's hard. The, each department has its own personality, but the school is extraordinarily strong in the diversity and the quality of the kinds of work that gets done. You know, at least as 
insofar as I certainly don't know everybody, but in assessing it through promotion cases that come through. It's remarkably diverse, I think, in ways that probably the outside world um, would have no way to appreciate because you just don't don't see it all. Um, and I think that diversity in its size adds to the strength and opportunity for for all the students. I think like every institution is struggling with how do you think through engineering education of the next decades and centuries and there are different views on, on how to make that happen. Um, and And to me it's a huge positive that people are thinking about that because you stay on top and you stay high quality because you continue to innovate and make it better and better and better. Um, and so the fact that it's full of people that are devoted to make that happen. One thing people perceive MIT as, a, and it is a research institution, and sometimes I often hear people say, yeah, but nobody cares about teaching here. And that has just not been my experience at all. I'm sure there are some individuals that don't place a value on it, but my experience has been uh, from the department head level to the faculty level that a huge amount of attention and care is paid to that part of education. That's been my That's experience a huge strength. Yeah. In, in talking to a variety of people that it, it's much more important than I would have expected yeah. that it would be. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I think that's one thing that may well, you know, again, I don't know if my perception about other institutions is equally flawed, <laughs> therefore, but um, but I, I do see that as a huge strength of, of engineering uh, at MIT. Um, is there anything um, unique about your department that you um, could point to? About electrical engineering? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, electrical engineering and computer science here, I think, is interesting in that it is electrical engineering and computer science. And in my time here, uh, when I first came, they were highly integrated. Uh, in the middle of my years here, they became, while they stayed in one department, they become much more intellectually separated and faculty separated. And then now that's come back together. So I think compared with with many other places around the country, uh, at least based on my somewhat limited experience, um, I, electrical engineering computer science has been able to evolve and weather changes in the field, partly because it's, it's big and diverse in that way. The challenge there is how do you define what the path is for students? you know, in a way that people feel is sufficiently deep and rigorous and sets them up for, you know, for whatever direction they tend to go in. Do you have a, a vision for, for what you'd like to see, um, how you'd like to see MIT develop, say, in the next generation? <laughs> um, you know, I'd... Uh, I, I, I do, I do think about what, what I'd love to see the MIT of, you know, 2050 be. Um, and and it, it pertains to this issue of creating uh, opportunities for multidisciplinary uh, students and faculty, not just in health, but in, in other areas. So I think a key to integration, or to innovation, is creating a forum in which people do bring disciplines together. It's not the only form of integration, innovation, but it's a, it's a, it's a huge part of where I think innovation comes from. And as I said earlier, I think creating that climate and the, uh, the culture and the reward structure and all and the educational paradigm and all those things that go with that is a different mindset than disciplinary. And what I'd love to see is for MIT to say, we, th we started this in 1970, we thought about it, now we're gonna make this, we're gonna make this an institution where you can come either way. You can be the next absolute superstar in this discipline, or you can be an expert in something, but with the, you know, living in this very multidisciplinary culture. So HST is not the only place now that has this kind of culture. It's perhaps the most well-developed, but engineering systems division is another example of something that, you know, at least conceptually draws on, on, on many different um, disciplines to solve big systems problems. So I think you could, and, you, and there's an effort and energy uh, 
there's a tendency now to separate the education from the research and keep the education you know disciplinary or department specific and I think ultimately it needs to be able to manage as an institutional level both those models and I think then it will continue to be at top and you'll attract spectacular people so that's what I'd love to see <laughs> so what's kept you here for 30 years <laughs> So I've been, you know, I've now lived in Boston longer than I've lived in, ever lived in Michigan, and uh, I have no designs to move. Um, you know, partly MIT is an amazing place, and I've had really a remarkable experience here. And the other, honestly, is that I have social, personal roots that, um, uh, yeah, I have a fabulous family and wonderful husband and lots of friends and I just can't imagine ripping that up and and moving um, you know if we talk about moving out of the Boston area and um, I've been able to do truly remarkable things since I've been here I'm you know I had my regular faculty experience and head of HST which was a whole other thing and now who knows what will be really the next <laughs> decade but um, I, I can't think of a better place than to to try it out here. So, what we have a f just a few more minutes. What haven't we talked about that you you think is important to mention or cover? Or, or? Oh, I don't know. You know, perhaps the, o the only thing that, uh, that I might add that you, you haven't touched on at all um, in your questions uh, relates to the more personal side of living a life at MIT. So one of the reasons I said, I, as a graduate student, I said, I'm done with MIT is, is not that I didn't like it professionally, but I was seriously concerned of, over whether you could have a life here. You know, and I talk to people. If, what if I, you know, can I have a family? You know, is this? Even though I no longer be, wanted to be a nursery school teacher, I didn't want to give up all the <laughs> other things I dreamed about as a little girl, right? Um, and uh, and I would have to say that that uh, though there have been many many challenges that that um, uh, I among many other women and men here have uh, have a uh, you know a reasonably balanced wonderful life that has been, um, that is integrated with my life at MIT, but is certainly, I'm not only uh, MIT 24-7. <laughs> um, and, and I think as, as young people try to decide what career path they have, I don't know that I've personally done what, what I could do, and I know generally we haven't done what we need to do to convey the fact that even though they see us in one context, that if they got a sense of the whole picture, that that this is really a marvelous, marvelously fulfilling way to spend your life, not just for professional reasons, but but personal reasons. When I, I became director of HST when my youngest was six months old, so um, you know, not I'm sure I would have spent more time at home had I not been running HST, and now I get more time. But I would not have thought that remotely possible um, when I first started at MIT. And I hope that continues to <laughs> be be true for every anybody that comes. I think a lot of making a successful institution of 2050 is making it a s successful for people to actually live, and not just is it professionally satisfying. It's it's your happiness is so much more than. Uh, than MIT per se, but that would be a good thing for more people to recognize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Any not everybody would agree with me on what I just said. It's also true. Yeah. Anything else? No, it's it's all that comes to mind. You've touched on an awful lot of my life. Yeah. Okay. Then I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs>